Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to be talking about CO2 and the basics of breathing. Okay, Andrew, let's kick it off with a very simple question. How is CO2 produced in the body? Uh, yeah, so CO2 is produced by um, uh, almost all of the body's cells, but in with regards to exercise, it, the, the main contributor to CO2 that we measure is in muscles. Mm -hmm. And what uh, influences how much CO2 you might produce if you think about different fuels, for example? Oh, uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, so CO2 is, the, is a byproduct of the breakdown of, of carbon-containing molecules, so the two main ones that we, that we use for fuels. Our, our glucose, a C6, six carbon molecule, or fatty acids, which are much longer trains of our carbon molecules. So theoretically, uh, the fats will produce more CO2 uh, for, the, um, for the number of molecules that are broken down. Realistically, what happens in the body is the harder you work, the more the body tends to shift towards breaking sugars down to produce more energy faster. So the carbon dioxide is produced in higher quantities, the harder you work. So we typically see the more glucose being consumed, the more CO2 being produced. So the higher efforts produce more CO2. Yeah. One thing I, I saw recently when I was looking into this, and I, I might be wrong, but I think what you said makes sense. But then at the same time, if we look at it, per ATP of molecule uh, recycled, then there's actually more CO2, um, uh, there's more CO2 generated by the breakdown of glucose than there is um, by the breakdown of uh, fats. But like you said, it's if, if we look at the at how many molecules we break down to begin with or how much energy we get on the at the at the end of it. Um, but again, like you, like you said, it makes sense as as you shift to burning more sugars, um, you're going to have uh, proportionally higher uh, CO2 production because per ATP delivered, we have more CO2. I think that's correct, but I'm... Yeah, yeah. no, you're, you're totally right. Free fatty acids and the breakdown of fats is a much more efficient right. way to produce energy. So you'll produce... The, the challenges for most people is the intensities that they want to, to perform at, especially mm -hmm. in races, um, they need to shift to more glucose-driven... Um, uh, ATP production. Uh, having said that, there is some really good evidence, uh, mostly, unfortunately, mostly anecdotal, but they, but a number of high endurance athletes who pre have performed very, very well on a fat adapted, on fat adapted diets. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're talking about sort of ultra endurance events and Ironman, I Ironman and longer events and the ability to produce enough energy to be able to be very competitive Mm. At world class competition on free fatty acids, almost um, primarily. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, those uh, theories are getting thrown on their heads by some of our higher, even higher, our world class athletes now who who are now racing at intensities that previously unheard of. Uh, you know, you look at at times from Christian Blumenfeld and some of those guys and the intensities that they're riding at, and they cannot do that on, on fats alone. They're, they're having to incorporate sugars into those uh, and, and they're, they're playing around with their diets to be able to make sure that they're able to tolerate uh, the fuel consumption to be able to make that. And that all has to do with uh, how to produce that much energy and, mm -hmm. the, and the fact that they're making, they're going so fast and their events are getting shorter and shorter, right? When you start looking at what used to be a nine hour race or, or a 10 hour race, and now they're yeah. doing it in seven and a half, 720, and they're aiming this year to try and break seven hours for an Ironman. It's a, it's a different race right. physiologically than it used to be. No, it's true. Um, moving on from that, what's the impact of CO2 on our breathing? Yeah, so CO2 is, is the prime controller of and driver for ventilation. So the higher levels of CO2 produced, the more you are going to be forced to breathe. And that's a response to uh, the chemoreceptors in the carotid bodies, uh, um, in, the, in the carotid arteries and in the aortic arch, mm -hmm. and the central receptors in the medulla that are, that are measuring physiologic pH, which is tightly um, associated with levels of CO2. 
Uh, and uh, so those drivers uh, are meant to maintain a physiologic pH between 7.35 and 7.45. And that's why breathing is so tightly associated or, or tightly controlled by the body is to maintain physiologic pH. And that's measured by CO2 and, and the dissociation of CO2 uh, into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So the higher CO2 drives that uh, equation to the right and you get mm -hmm. bicarbon and acid. Mm -hmm. The acid is detrimental to the body by shifting the pH. And so the body responds by blowing off the CO2 to shift that equation back off to the left. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Now, if we look more systemically, what is the impact of CO2 on our physiology in general? Yeah, so tons of effects. So uh, the biggest ones from a sport performance is uh, va peripheral vasodilation, uh, increased cardiac output in terms of both heart rate and uh, contractility. Do, do, so you know what the do you know what the mechanism is uh, on, the, on the heart? level um, um i know i know the i know that it changes the cardiac output by increasing contractility and heart rate how mm -hmm. it how that is affected i or, or the mechanism that co2 does that uh, i i i don't know if it's a central effect or a peripheral effect I, yeah i'm not i'm not sure okay okay uh yeah okay i'll let you and I'll then let... uh, yeah and then the, the third effect is the unloading of oxygen. So it actually affects the oxygen dissociation curves. Higher CO2 allows for or pushes oxygen delivery to the, at the periphery uh, and actually leads to unloading of oxygen. All of these things that those, the vasodilation, the unloading of the oxygen and the increase in current contractility is to move blood faster through the system and allow for more CO2 to be expelled from the lungs. So those are, those are the, the three physiologic mechanisms on top of the, of the drive for breathing. Yeah, and uh, what can we do to modulate those CO2 levels, say during exercise? What can we do and then why would we wanna do it? Mm. Uh, so yeah, so you're, the, the easiest way to modulate CO2 is to change your breathing, right? So the, the slower you breathe or the smaller breaths you take, the higher levels of CO2 you'll have. Mm -hmm. And from a sports performance perspective, that those shifts, if you think about what, what the effects of the high CO2 will be, can help drive changes in performance. So if your body needs more oxygen at the periphery and higher cardiac output to perform better, then retaining CO2 and allowing the CO2 levels to rise is gonna have a beneficial effect on performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has been, has been measured in studies and shown that people with higher CO2 tolerance, the ability to tolerate higher levels of CO2 before hyperventilating to get rid of it, will actually perform better and will have better cardiac dynamics, better oxygen supply to the periphery and better unloading and, and, and oxygen supply to where it's needed, which is the working muscles. Yeah, that's something you could definitely see. I've played with the, the VO2 master on that. And you, if you try to voluntarily hyperventilate at a given wattage, uh, what you're going to see is your fraction of expired O2 dropping significantly. If it's, I don't know, for me around 16, maybe when I'm breathing, say normally or without forcing myself and I'm able to drop it to 14 and below uh, by really forcing myself to breathe uh, less air simply by per minute. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable feeling, uh, but you can definitely see how that changes. Now, one question that I have for you on that. Um, so the effect is better unloading. Like we said, you extract more oxygen the, from, from the volume that you breathe in, but that also means that, and from what I've noticed, at least uh, VO2 tends to go up a little bit. So because, because you're extracting more per unit of time, now VO2 goes up. So what does that do for, say, economy, for example? Uh, so so that, it's, that is a question that, is not, that has not actually been studied very well yet. And really, I think that is a, res a response uh, in researchers not having access to, to inexpensive and portable monitors like we have now. So this is where I'm really hoping that, that researchers are going to pick up on this, these conversations 
and start looking at what happens to performance at, at different intensities with different breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reason the, so one of the reasons that the oxygen consumption is going to be higher with a slower breathing is the fact that you're unloading oxygen more easily at the periphery. Yep. Yep. And we see that when, and one of the reasons that, that VO2 master uh, incorporates MOXIE data uh, and NIRS data into our um, app is because we've seen how the, the benefits of seeing how oxygen is being used peripherally and centrally is such, is such a unique tool for coaches and for athletes. So we see MOXIE data, we see SMO2 numbers drop dramatically with slower breathing, even at, at a no change in intensity. Mm -hmm. So there's more oxygen being used by the body efficiently to produce energy. What we don't know is, is what's what fuels being, does it change the fuel sources that are being used? Does it allow for more fatty acid oxidation? Does it allow for faster glucose metabolism? We actually don't know. Mm. It hasn't been studied. Um, and what is the beneficial effects or is there a beneficial effects performance wise at a steady state intensity? My, my anecdotal evidence would be it, it does. If you slow breathe, your efficiency improves, your oxygen, uh, your ability to unload oxygen improves, your legs feel better, your fe your, the feeling, the RPE at that level, the perceived exertion at that same intensity goes down. Mm -hmm. There is some evidence that there's, that there's that sympathetic response. So there's a reduction in sympathetic drive. So there's a calming feeling, a relaxing feeling of slower breathing on top of the physiologic changes that happen as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in everything that we've seen with the athletes that we've worked with, uh, and in the anecdotal evidence, is that the slower breathing is a, is has multitude of effects. Some of them are physiological, some of them are psychological, and they haven't been studied enough yet to have a clear indication of uh, to back up the what the theory of the physiology of of why those things are happening. Yeah, well, one thing uh, for those who maybe want some further reading, I, I fell on a, uh, I, I found a couple papers that were talking about myoglobin saturation uh, and its affinity to fatty uh, acid uh, for transport and then oxidation. And both both of those papers seem to point in the direction of essentially the more oxygen you have in the muscle and the more your myoglobin is saturated with oxygen, the higher affinity it has for uh, free fatty acid transport and thus the higher free fatty acid oxidation you get. So that that's maybe something to, to look into, to go, to go a little bit deeper than, than what we did here. Um, Andrew, that was a lot of fun. We're going to do another video on CO2 tolerance. For the, so for those interested, stay tuned for that. Make sure you drop us a like, leave a comment below if you enjoyed uh, the content and uh, we'll see you in the next video.